Enter the GN ITX case reviews. We've completely revisited and overhauled our ATX testing methodology and applied it to ITX cases and small form factor cases. This includes new test approaches and charts and new data, including thermocouple logged BRM temperatures. Our ITX reviews start with a mini roundup of just three cases, and this is meant just to kickstart the charts and we'll soon add more cases to the list, including a few that are under NDA presently. Today, we're benchmarking and mini-reviewing the Cryorig Taku, an RT $300 box, the Boxy Thermaltake Core V1, and the true-to-form Silverstone SG13. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzlies High-End Thermal Paste and Liquid Metal. Thermal Grizzlies Cryonaut is an affordable, high-quality thermal compound that doesn't face some of the aging limitations of other pastes on the market. Cryonaut has a thermal conductivity of 12.5 watts per meter Kelvin, focuses on endurance, is easy to spread, and isn't electrically conductive, making it safe to use on GPU dyes. Thermal Grizzly also makes Conductonaut liquid metal, which we've used to drop 20 degrees off some temperatures in our delitted tests. Buy a tube at the link in the description below. These are the three cases we're working with today. The interesting thing with ITX reviews is that actually, from a review standpoint, they're harder to work with than ATX cases. With ITX cases, you're looking at things that are partially subjective, like what's your cutoff for how big it is in terms of volume? The SG13 is the smallest of these three, but the V1 isn't that much worse, although it is two times the volume roughly. So you kind of have a cutoff that's a personal thing where this might be acceptable for someone, it might be way too big for someone else, but it's still kind of a small-ish box that would go in a home theater environment. So those definitions notwithstanding, other things to consider with these small form factor PC cases is uh, stuff like full length video card support. All of these support full length video cards to most extents, at least to the extent of reference full length cards. They also uh, support in varying capacities, air coolers, liquid coolers, tower coolers, and so forth. The Taku clearly not a fan of a tower cooler or a taller cooler, but you can fit a small 50 millimeter cooler in there or something like that. The SG13, you could easily fit a liquid cooler in it, just like a 120. The V1 could actually fit some of these smaller mini tower coolers. So when you're looking at all those things, it makes ITX case reviews the least possible scientific review, although we can still control for as many variables as possible. The fact of the matter is, if we test with the same standardized hardware with everything, which we always do, you run into issues where on a case that can clearly fit more hardware, like that one, which can fit a larger cooler, you'll see worse results if constrained to the coolers that were selected for smaller cases. So keep that in mind. But we can still do a standardized test, which will at least give us a baseline for the hardware we have, which is a downdraft cooler. And we'll have the full test bench and methodology linked in the article in the description below if you want to learn more about that. But things we've added this time that are pretty important, one of them is we're now mounting uh, a, we have a fixed thermocouple on one of the MOSFETs. So this is really just to see, does a hotspot get generated in a particular ITX case where the MOSFET sits that we've probed. And then we also have new testing where we're just showing the frequency over time. So we can look at these three cases for GPU frequency over time and look at what's the actual frequency degradation, not just is it throttling yes or no, but how much is it throttling? And we'll have a couple new charts for that as well. And we're trying to get into noise normalized testing. That's still kind of being refined right now. We've done it for our CPU coolers. It's a lot harder to do with ITX cases uh, for reasons that'll be listed in the article. So anyway, today these are the three cases. We're adding more rapidly. Check back soon for those. Uh, the TAC is $300. The SG-13s, we added an extra fan to it because it comes with none. So that puts its effective price at $55. And the Core V1 is a $48 case, comes with a 200 millimeter front fan. And that's it for that one, although it does have space for more. Uh, so we can go through all of these. But first off, case dimensions are probably the most important for ITX cases when you're selecting one. For our three cases today, the Cryorig Taku measures at 25.1 liters or 14.8 if you don't count the legs. The Core V1 at 22.7 liters and the SG13 at an impressive 11.5 liters, just volume. You could fit two SG13s in the other cases if you were able to strip it down to bare components, basically, and let it sit there. So that's certainly a, it puts Silverstone in an interesting place where they're the smallest by significant margin. So their thermals could be worse, but also it's got a mesh front. 
Makes it really interesting to find out. And uh, we can also go through the cases one by one before getting to the thermal results. We'll start with the Taku for that. The first case we tested was also the most different from the rest of the group. The Cryorig Taku is a flat, horizontal Mini-ITX monitor stand, as they call it. The Taku's quality can be neatly divided into two aspects, outside and inside. Externally, the Taku is artsy and presentable, constructed of thick, unpainted aluminum with sturdy wooden legs that seem to make a statement. And the statement is, I'm rich because it's $300. The faceplate is blank white plastic with only a large circular power button backed by a soft white power LED and a less pleasant hard drive LED, but that can be unplugged, it's red. The ventilation holes are symmetrical and mostly invisible from the front, and that's also the angle from which you're most likely to see it. So from a visual standpoint, they're going for a very specific home theater look. For an MITX case, the Taku is large including the empty air between the legs, the volume of the space taken up is approximately equal to a normal tower laid on its side, an ATX tower at that. That could help with GPU airflow, we'll test this later, but it also means that despite being shaped like a VHS player, the Taku probably won't fit in an entertainment center without removing those legs. And when used as a monitor stand, it might lift the display uncomfortably high, depending on what you're going for in your home theater setup. CryoRig's website does specifically advertise the Taku as, quote, an ITX monitor stand, and the outer construction is definitely solid enough to support a modern display. There are important ventilation holes on top of the case, however, so covering them up with the stand of a monitor is a bad idea. Just be careful about that. If you could go with a wall mount, it might be better. As for internals, the most striking feature of the Taku is the sliding drawer, which allows the entire system to be slid out a few inches on the tray for easy access, sort of like the BitPhoenix portal. The drawer solution does allow for opening the case without moving the monitor off the top, but the mechanism is elaborate and seems delicate compared to regular latches and thumb screws. The drawer idea is cool, it just, we need to see a more robust system that doesn't waste precious space, like a removable panel or a hinged lid. Space is limited by nesting everything inside of the drawer rather than just attaching components directly to the outer shell, which is another potential downside of that design. The wide, flat layout of the Taku isn't naturally suited to PC components. Everything is cramped despite the size of the case. Our CPU cooler only measures 47 millimeters tall from the cold plate to the top of the fan, but it was still uncomfortably close for airflow purposes to touching the case filters. The power supply is positioned as far as possible from the 24-pin ATX connector on our motherboard, and although CryoRig did include an extension cable, there's no logical path for routing it. The intended path is under a metal bar at the bottom of the case, but there's no space around the edges of the board, and crossing cables over the top of the board would interfere with the CPU fan. We threaded it through the SSD cage instead, which limited us to a single SSD. The single 90 millimeter fan included with the case, and there's only one for it, is mounted on top of the SSD cage. SSDs don't need direct cooling, certainly not like that, and there's more support needed in the GPU or the CPU. The error that flows off the SSD isn't directed at the motherboard either, and it would be blocked by RAM if it were, and the fan placement seems to be more of a matter of where can we fit a fan rather than where would it help to have a fan. We have a lot more thoughts on this case, but check the written review linked in the description below for more reading on those thoughts. Moving on to Thermal Takes Core V1, this is one of the older ITX cases that's still sold. The V1 takes a relaxed approach to space saving, it's almost exactly twice the volume of SG-13, and that offers a few advantages. It's also bigger, which is counterintuitive to the point of ITX. Whether or not the size increase is acceptable, though, will depend on where you plan to place the system. The interior of the V1 is divided into two sections by the horizontal motherboard tray, and this gives room for the PSU chamber below. Cable management is excellent and trivially done, and none of the power supply cables have to stretch too far. They can be routed over the two edges of the motherboard for easy access to everything except for our CPU power socket. Because it's a cube, the four side panels of the case are interchangeable. One is acrylic, two are vents, and one is clearly intended as a bottom panel with four plastic legs and a PSU filter. Since every panel is interchangeable, any side of the case could be made the new bottom. So you could actually change any of these. The top panel currently has acrylic in it. We found there were some interesting thermal implications with our downdraft cooler, obviously, and we moved that to the side and put mesh on the top. You could also do that and just move where the feet are. So now we can move the feet to the bottom one and suddenly you have a very interesting and unique inverted PC. So that's something to note. It's, it's probably the most, it's the simplest possible design element 
where it seems like they went with the square interchangeable panels out of ease and cost, and then later could have gone, wait a minute, that's a really good marketing point. So the V1's interesting for that reason. Material quality is fine for the price. It's certainly not impressive. The Taku is far and away the best material and build quality. It's also $300. It's a big difference there. Let's get into the SG-13 for the last one. The SG-13 is a low-cost, bare-bones Silverstone case from the good old days when they put mesh front panels on everything. It launched in 2015, but we hadn't actually worked on it until now. The SG-13B has all the features we like from the RL-06, a focus on airflow primarily, a functional design, and nothing extra to raise the price. Not even a fan. There's not much to look at on the outside. It's just a metal box to put a computer in. There's some indentations on the front mesh that probably help to prevent flexing, and there are two intentional larger indentations in the top mesh that don't prevent flexing at all and make the case look like it's warped. And the outer shell is made of very thin steel that hooks into the chassis with metal tabs that don't seem to want to line up correctly at the same time. On the bottom of the case, there are four very nice grippy rubber feet that make the case charmingly bouncy. We actually really like the the selection of the rubber feet on this case by Silverstone. It's got a good overall feel to it and it does actually kind of bounce in an interesting way. But the case itself, there's no bottom intake or anything. So that elevation does nothing for you. It's a very plain case. It's a flat metal bottom. So it's really just to get it off the ground a bit. It doesn't help with ventilation or cooling. Cooling intake exhaust are very interesting on this one because what you're left with is a front intake clearly this side has a mesh, and that's where your video card will pull air from outside the case in, so that's an intake. For our setup, the top is an intake, because we have a downdraft cooler, and then this side is slightly obstructed. So you end up with a lot of the exhaust going out through the I.O. of the case, and we don't put an I.O. shield on, so that actually probably helps a bit in this scenario. Uh, so basically, when you're planning a build in a case like this one, this is an instance where testing with a standardized be bench, although perfect for what we're doing, is not something you'd want to do in a real use case scenario. You'd probably want to go with something like a 120 or 140 CLC, just because then you can direct your airflow a bit better, uh, even though we still got really good results on this one, as you'll see momentarily. So there's not much to look at on the outside with it. Kill management is unfortunately non-existent. Even the reference photos in Silverstone's own manual show a big wad of cables that barely avoids snagging on the fans in the front. That's the nature, though, of having a case that's half the volume of anything else on this table. It's the smallest by far. There's a sacrifice, and it's cables. Silverstone gets full credit for not, not sacrificing on GPU length. You can put basically a full-length card in here. You can put a CLC in here, and that's pretty damn good for a case of this size for 40 bucks. Then you buy a fan, obviously, if you don't have a CLC and call it a day. So getting into the thermals and noise here, Silverstone's case basically took the approach of trying to be true to form to SFF. Thermal takes is the next closest. It is a small-ish box. You can hide it in a media center if you want to, but it's significantly larger. And then the Taku is an artsy approach to ITX, and it's gonna suffer thermally for that, but also nothing else looks quite like it or functions quite like it, you pay for that. As previously, results for these tests are not comparable to our other case tests. Our ITX test bench uses 100% different components, including new components from Gigabyte and Enermax, who are the sponsors of this particular test bench, where Enermax provided the SFX power supply, Gigabyte provided the video card and motherboard. And you can learn more about the methodology in the article below. We're starting with our 3 Mark Firestrike test, which is a gaming stand and benchmark that generates a realistic load on both the CPU and the GPU. Remember, we're just starting on ITX reviews, so these charts are sparse. CPU temperatures across the board are acceptable for this configuration. The Silverstone SG-13 is the lead performer right now, keeping the GPU at 50.1 degrees over ambient. This is well below throttle territory and is actually good even when compared to ATX cases in some instances. The front intake fan on the SG-13 helps tremendously here, and the Thermal Take Core V1 operates about 4 degrees warmer at 54.1 degrees over ambient, which is also acceptable. The CryoRig Taku is pushing it. It's running a 61 degree delta T over ambient. After accounting for ambient temperature, that puts us right against the major thermal limitation with the GPU Boost 3.0, and our actual diode temperature is closer to 83 with throttle territory at 84. So we're actually dropping clocks here. In fact, this frequency over time chart shows that. You'll see that the SG13 maintains an average clock of about 1780 to 1800 megahertz, whereas the Taku sits closer to 1740 to 1760 megahertz with some dips down to 1670 megahertz. That's not a lot. You're talking about single digit FPS differences, 
but it's certainly a demonstration of how thermals impact performance. Next up, Blender performance with CPU rendering is also helpful for looking at VRM thermals, which we'll look at momentarily. For CPU thermals first, both the SG13 and Core V1 operate at equivalence within error margins. Both cases are at about 48 degrees over ambient for the CPU. The GPU, which is unused here, is also within error margins for the differences. The Cryorig Taku isn't throttling or performing in a way that drastically affects performance, but it certainly could be better. The GPU, which is idle during this test, is still operating at 16 degrees above ambient. That's impressively lacking in cooling and performance, because again, it's not even being used. It's not hurting anything, but it speaks to the design of the chassis. The CPU operates about five degrees warmer than the thermal taken in Silverstone cases. Performance isn't great, but it's fine, considering this test is relatively lightweight on total system thermal strain, doing okay overall. VRM thermals during Blender gives us another metric to consider, but doesn't reveal any serious design flaws. The SG13 and V1 are both operating at about 34 degrees over ambient for the hotspot MOSFET, or about 35 for the SOC VRM. Taku is about 40 over ambient. For perspective, in order for even the Taku's measurement to really matter, you'd have to have a room ambient time temperature of something like 60 or 70 degrees, and basically the water in your body would start boiling before you even had catastrophic failure with these MOSFETs. Although interesting, this load isn't intensive enough to matter for this measurement. GPU rendering with Blender produces a lineup with SG13 in the lead. At 32 degrees over ambient, the Core V1 positioned 2 degrees warmer, and the Taku nearing 40 degrees. Torture testing is a little abusive on these small boxes. We run power viruses on both components simultaneously. In an absolute worst case thermal testing scenario, the Taku has its drawer opened for basically an open air test bench baseline, and we see that it performs best, naturally. This gives us an idea for the kind of impedance that these cases are causing, resulting in obstructed airflow in a few instances, like the Taku. The Taku establishes a baseline of 54.7 degrees over ambient for unobstructed airflow, an improvement of 13 degrees over the stock Taku 67.5 degree result. The Silverstone SG13 tested at 65.6 degrees with removal of its filter improving performance by about three degrees. The fact that Silverstone's filter only impacts performance to this minimal level is noteworthy, and it's well worth keeping the filter in place. The Thermal Take Core V1 tested with the acrylic window in the top position operated at 69 degrees. This was the worst performer technically, but is only in this configuration where the top panel is completely blocked off. Given that we're using a downdraft cooler, that result makes sense. Shifting the acrylic to the other side and putting mesh on the top, we drop down to 66.7 degrees, comfortably between the SG13 and the Taku. The RM thermals under this torture test are a bit higher than previous tortures, but still uneventful overall. That's a good thing, to be fair. It's just not very exciting. Open air in the Taku, drawer open, V-Core VRM thermals loaded to about 39 degrees over ambient, with SOC thermals at 40 degrees. The stock Taku ran significantly warmer, about 12 degrees warmer, at 50 degrees Celsius over ambient V-Core, or 56 for VSOC. The Thermal Take Core V1 ran warmest of all, thanks to the top mounted acrylic, but was still fine. The mesh top V1 dropped thermals by 2 to 3 degrees under the acrylic topped V1, and the Silverstone's SG13 was the most impressive, with a baseline V-Core load temperature of 46 degrees, just 8 degrees above the open air test. GPU torture thermals are a bit more varied and establish the SG13 in a minor lead over the Core V1, and a dominating lead over the Taku. The Taku holds a lead when left open, which isn't really much of a Taku test, it's more of an open air test bench. Noise normalized testing establishes the SG13 and Core V1 as near each other in performance, with a CPU cooler configured to 80%. We actually had to run the Taku with a CPU cooler at 90% and decrease the intake fan because it was so thermally choked under the CPU and GPU components that it restricted test conditions. So that one sort of failed this test. And that's the start of our ITX case reviews. We have a lot more coming. We're probably gonna try and focus on some of the more performance focused ITX cases to start with, stuff like this or this one because they're the most comparable across charts. The Taku, although it looks bad in some of those thermal tests, it's also not really meant to be a performance case. It's basically a rich media center case where you kind of want something that fits your high-end living room with your high-end TV and your high-end friends who have a lot of money and drive fancy Audis and BMWs. That's who the Taku's meant for. So although we could criticize its design in a lot of ways and clearly have, it's also hard to really fault it super hard for the thermal conditions because it's just not trying to do that and if you don't use a system that was, you know, 1070 Ti, something like that, 1070, 1080, something that class of GPU and maybe a lower power CPU, you'd be okay. But if you're planning to get the Taku and a high-end graphics card, which you could afford, clearly, because you're spending $300 on a case, 
you might have a problem. And we'd suggest with the Taku that you may want to consider going with replacing the small fan they have here with something higher RPM if you can find it. And absolutely do not put a TV stand on top of any ventilation on the top. That'll be a problem. That's their biggest design flaw. The drawer is okay. It's just, I mean, it's, it's kind of neat, but really, how many times do you need to do that? It takes a lot of space. It definitely costs a lot of money. So that seems like something that could go in favor of just, I don't know, maybe lifting up the top and building in the system normally. Be able to reduce the size overall, reduce the cost, and maybe even improve thermals in some instances. The V1 is the most versatile. It's the ease of use winner. It was the easiest to build in this one. It's got the most cable management space, but it's not that small. It is small-ish, but it's not as small as the SG13. Depending on what you're looking for, if that size is acceptable to, for you, we've liked it more or less since the case came out. It's a fine case. It's one of the better ones that Thermal Takes made in recent years. The SG13 is also a fine case, but it's a lot harder to work in. It has way less cable management space. It potentially has some thermally constrained scenarios, but performed exceptionally well, better than that one in most of our tests. So even though it can be constrained, depending on how you configure the system, if you configure it in a way that is mindful of what you're working with and you do keep those cables out of way, then you'll be fine. And yes, cable management in cases like these actually can impact airflow for once pretty much inconsequential on ATX cases, but ITX has way less volume to work with. So that's our start. Here's what we want from you. We want to know what ITX cases do you specifically want to see tested. Leave a comment below. We'll try and buy them or acquire them or get samples, and we'll let you know how it goes. But that's it for now. As always, subscribe for more. Links in the description below for more information. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly, or go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of these mod mats or one of our rotating crystals back here with the 3D teardown logo in it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.